السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek his mercy and we seek his forgiveness And we send our peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when we talk about the importance of giving, of caring, of having that understanding of what is going on around us, this is something, my dear brothers and sisters, that our religion has taught us from day one. From the very first moment of revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he comes home to his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, shivering and shaking and saying, I fear that something bad is going to happen to me. The response of our mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha taught us what it was that would bring comfort to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What was it that would bring some ease, console the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? She didn't say, your Lord will not disgrace you because you spend your days and your nights worshiping him in a cave. She didn't say, your Lord will not disgrace you or your Lord will not let anything bad happen to you because you seclude yourself from your family and from the society around you, worshiping him and remembering him and reflecting literally 24-7, weeks and months at a time. Rather, she said, فَوَاللَّهِ لَا يُخْزِيكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا Your Lord would never disgrace you because you are the one who feeds the poor and the hungry. You are the one who takes care of the needy. You are the one who looks for the one who is struck with a calamity and removes that hardship for them. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow any harm upon you when you are constantly in the service of humanity, when you are constantly in the service of others, when you are constantly bringing relief and aid, and you are a source of mercy for others. And this is something that wasn't just a one-time thing where she said it to console him. You know, you did some community service, you helped people, don't worry, it's all good. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very early on, made it a point to mention this over and over. All of the verses that you and I have memorized from a young age. Just look at Juz Amma alone. The verse is talking about taking care of the orphan. Five times the orphan is mentioned in that Juz alone. At a time of persecution, at a time of rejection, at a time where people are attacking him, and saying that he's a liar and a magician and a madman, Allah is saying, Let me tell you the true nature of these people who reject this religion. They are the ones who are harsh with the orphan. They do not take care, they don't encourage the feeding of the hungry. Very early on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that while these times are going to be tough, while you're out there reminding the people as Imam Rafiq said about la ilaha illallah, about worshipping one God, with that, not separated from that. Not you do this, you know, at times and then you do that at times. In the middle of all of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded the companions and the early Muslims about that obligation of taking care of those around you. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and many of the companions, they carried on that legacy as time went on, even after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar radiallahu anhu, it is narrated that when he was Khalifa, he would often walk the streets and he would look at the condition of the people. 
What's going on around me? What can I do to fix the situation? He would go and check up on the people. And this is of the signs of a good leader. Is that they are out there with the people, checking up on them. And Umar would do this often. One time he and his servant, they went further than usual in the outskirts of Medina. And Umar, he came across a woman who was cooking pebbles. She was cooking rocks. And he asked her, what are you doing? What benefit is this going to bring to you? She said, we don't have any food at home. And I'm cooking these rocks so that my children, while they're playing, they get tired of waiting for the food and they go to sleep. And I do this every single day. And she said, wallahi, that wait till the day of judgment when I complain to Allah about Amirul Mu'mineen, not knowing who she was talking to. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he began to cry and weep. And he ran back, back into Medina, into the Baytul Mal. He started to gather whatever he could of food and sustenance. And he started to carry it back to the home of this woman. And his servant said, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, why are you carrying this? Let me carry it for you. And he said, leave me be, as on, for on the day of judgment, you will not be there to carry my sins for me. He saw this as something that was potentially sinful for him, that a person is starving and he doesn't know about it. And he's not helping and he's not coming to their aid. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would often be with the people feeling the way that they were feeling. During the year of severe famine, his wife would have to beg him to eat. He said, I will not eat until the people eat. He would point to his stomach when it growled. And he said, growl all you want, for you will not get anything until the people eat. And he would tie a rock to his stomach, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when, uh, to suppress the hunger. And one time, to kind of show off to the Prophet wasallam. obviously, if we're doing a good deed, we want the Prophet wasallam to notice, to tell us we're doing a good job. Umar, he lifted his shirt and he said, Ya Rasulullah, look. Showing the rock tied to his stomach. And the Prophet wasallam did not respond with any word. He simply lifted his shirt to show that there were two rocks tied to his stomach. That as much pain and hunger as you're feeling, I'm feeling twice the pain. I suffer twice as much. So this is something that when we look at these stories and we might think like, okay, this is something that was common back in the day. This is something that happened often. They didn't have food. We know the narrations that meat wouldn't be cooked for months at a time in the house of the Prophet wasallam. But it's not a foreign concept. This is something that happens even today. And maybe even far worse in some places. According to the United Nations Environment Program, they say that with regards to food, with regards to food alone, in this country alone, 40% of the food that is cooked and prepared goes to waste. 40% of the food that is meant for consumption goes to waste. And we might see some of that at this convention even. Just pass by the dining area, look at the tables, look into the garbage cans. How many people could have benefited from that meal that we just tossed away like it was nothing? They said one trillion dollars worth of food is wasted every single year. That enough food in industrialized societies is wasted to, feel, to feed the over 200 million people suffering in East Africa right now and in other parts of the world. According to even the world, world Health Organization, with regards to just water, something that we take for granted, how many sips of a bottle we take and then we have no idea where that bottle went or we just toss it to the side and then open up a new one and toss it to the side. They said women and children all across the world on average spend six hours every single day trying to collect water alone. Just trying to gather water, enough water for themselves and their families. 
And we know what's happening right now in Africa with the 20 million people facing a harsh drought where many of them are losing their lives. But what can we do about that? Our concern is not just for myself and for my family and not even for the person in my community or neighborhood because our Prophet wasallam he taught us that the ummah is like one body. One body and if one part of that body feels sick, the rest of it should feel sick. If one part of that body feels pain, the rest of that body should suffer along with that one body. That one part, as far away from us as that might be. But it is our responsibility. It is something as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, would be a burden for me on the day of judgment. These are sins that I carry on my back. But the good news, my dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, the work is being done. Helping Hand for Relief and Development, the international relief wing of ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America, alhamdulillah, over the last 10 years, has been working actively on your behalf in over 50 countries around the world. From the Middle East with our office in Jordan, to Africa with, with our office in Kenya, to Pakistan with, with our office in Islamabad, to Haiti, the Philippines, Burma, all over the world, alhamdulillah, we are on your behalf, on behalf of the Muslim community here in America, have been serving the people. And I mentioned, you know, food and hunger. And I remember in Jordan alone, and Jordan is a developed country. When we think of Jordan, it's not like a third world war-torn country. It's developed. Alhamdulillah, over the last two years, and again this year, we've been going on a trip called Youth for Jordan. Maybe some of you have heard of that trip, where we take about 40 or 50 students from the U.S. over to Jordan to spend an entire week working with the refugees, with the, uh, with the Syrian and Palestinian refugees, with the orphans that we're supporting, over 2,500 Syrian orphans that we're currently supporting over there. And my brother Talha, who, who, who went on this trip with us, reminded me of the story. When we s were serving food to the Syrian refugees living in the desert, one day we said, let's take like gourmet food to them. Instead of the simple handout, let's do something special for them. So we went to a restaurant, grabbed like big platters and trays of rice and chicken and vegetables, and we took it over to their tents. And they were extremely overjoyed. And when we saw them sitting there eating, we noticed that the children were eating the rice and the vegetables. And they were taking the pieces of chicken and putting it to the side. And they would take the pieces of chicken and put it to the side. And they're eating the rice and vegetables. And when we asked their parents and the elders that were with us, why are they doing this? What child actually wants to eat the vegetables? They said, many of them don't know what this is. They don't know what this piece of meat is. To them, all they've known is rice and vegetables. And to them, this was just something extra and they were throwing it to the side. Some of the kids who did know about it, maybe they were a little older, 10 years old, they were putting it in their pockets. They said, we don't want to eat it now. We had the rice and vegetables. We'll take the pieces of chicken. They would put it in their pocket. They said, we're going to save it for our family later on. Because we know once you guys leave, our condition is going to go back to the same. And so we want to save as much of it as possible. Right? This is the condition that our brothers and sisters are living in around the world. That we have gone and sat with them and witnessed their condition. Young kids telling us how when they found out a, a woman telling us of her five kids that telling her our story that my husband was supposed to come home from work when we were in Syria and when the, there was a knock on the door and we opened the door we found his body laying there in front of us our 10 year old cried so much he lost the ability to speak and he, we saw him there with us playing but couldn't talk she said for two weeks straight he cried just screaming on top of his lungs, he lost his voice. So the trauma that, that many of these people are facing on top of the food and the hunger. Well, alhamdulillah, helping hand is on the ground now, 
working with the Syrian refugees. We visit them every year, but we have our, our entire office in that part of the region that is working with them every single day. To tell you briefly about our work, the key word here is development, for relief and development. Because it's one thing to give a handout, to give a plate of rice, to give you know, a supply, a school supply, to give even money, but to develop them and to sustain them long term, that's our goal. So we have projects such as the Syrian Children Education Program, where we're working to provide education for the kids, these children living in refugee camps who don't have access to education. Many of their parents are sending their 9, 10, 11 year old kids to go in the street and sell stuff, to go in warehouses and work 12, 15 hours a day. A 12 year old coming to us complaining about back pain because he's carrying heavy machinery. And so we've made a commitment to the parents of these kids that we will pay for your child's education. In some cases it's free, but we tell the parents we'll pay you extra money. So for $2 a day, literally, we're sending a child to school for an entire year. With that $2 a day, we're giving the parents money. And we're saying, do not make your child work. This is our contract with you. We will send them to school. We will pay for their supplies, their, their transportation, their education. And we will give you money. Don't make them work. Our goal and our fear is an entire generation might be lost. Our goal is to inshallah stabilize the youth that, that are living in these conditions that inshallah when they go back to their country they will be the ones who will help to inshallah recover and rebuild it ta'ala. That is our goal, long term stability. You might have heard of our caravan home project where after our trip again to Jordan last summer many of our youth who were from this country who were over there came up with this, with this idea about two years ago. Why don't we build for the refugees living in tents? Why don't we build homes, like caravan trailer homes? We call them in the US trailer homes, right? We even have, you know, negative terminology to describe the people living in these homes. So we're sending, uh, inshallah, for $5,000 overseas, they're building these caravan homes in Jordan and taking them to the refugee camps, people who are living in the middle of the desert. Maybe you've heard of Zaatari camp. We're working outside of that camp. Hundreds and thousands of families left that main camp because they couldn't handle the harsh conditions and they're living now in the middle of nowhere, no help or support. What we're doing is trying to put them into homes. Our goal for last year is to kick off this project. Let's try to see if we can get 100 homes sponsored. Within four, four months, we were able to get almost 200 homes sponsored. Alhamdulillah. We were able to put these families out of the tents and into homes. The tents that they're living in are worn out. They were complaining about scorpions and snakes coming in at night and the children being scared. They're complaining about the, wash, uh, the harsh conditions of the weather in the winter and in the summer. And so we put them into these homes. These, and they're in, in, in the four walls. They have two rooms, a bathroom, uh, water supply, electricity. Hamza, this is all the work that Helping Hand is doing again on your behalf. Why? For long-term stability, inshallah ta'ala. One sister, when we handed her the key to her caravan home, she said, I forgot how this works. She couldn't open, the, she couldn't put the key in. She said, I haven't used the key in six years. I forgot how it works. Another sister, when we put their family into the caravan home, she said, Wallahi, it feels like you just gave us Jannah. This is the joy. They said, we haven't, we haven't been happy in the last, last six years. This small amount that you were able to give us, wallahi, we couldn't ask for anything more. So our goal as an organization, again, long-term stability. One of the programs we have, the skills development program. Again, not just a simple handout. We're teaching the refugee women, many of them widows or their husbands can't get work. And many of them never worked their entire lives and they didn't have to. But now we're teaching them different skills like sewing, you know, what kind of work that they can do with their hands, that they can go out to businesses and offer their, their services. So we're teaching them these different skills. We, we are working again on your behalf and we look to continue that partnership inshallah ta'ala. We have a booth in the bazaar. Our goal for this convention is to sponsor the education of as many Syrian children, brothers and sisters as we can living in Jordan. 
every single child that we talked to, we said, what do you want? They didn't want a toy. They didn't ask for food. They didn't ask for money. They said, we want to go to school. We want to be like everyone else. We want to go to school. Can you make that happen for us? And so we're asking you tonight, inshallah ta'ala, can we make that happen for our brothers and sisters? Stop by the Helping Hand booth in the bazaar. Inshallah, let's work together on providing and being that mercy onto mankind. Wa jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.